Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everybody. Weekend is almost upon us. First up, the lockdown situation in Shanghai and across the country. Let's start with the good before we talk about the bad and the ugly. Though it is too early to say for sure, Shanghai may finally be approaching a point where a real large-scale opening up may be possible as official numbers continue to come down. Shanghai health authorities announced in a special press conference yesterday, "Quote: The outbreak in Shanghai has shown a good trend, and the vital transmission risk has been effectively curbed." Daily new cases have seen an obvious fall, and fewer positive cases were found in areas beyond quarantine facilities, where the epidemic risk has been effectively controlled. End quote. As of today, eight Shanghai districts have basically achieved zero community transmissions. In Beijing, official numbers are positive too. Official numbers. New cases yesterday were all detected among personnel under closed-off management. Hidden transmission sources and communities still exist in the capital. However, so Beijing will continue with mass testing for now. Many stay-at-home orders for workers still apply, though. Of course, if the official numbers are wildly unreliable. Or if the last few 100 new daily cases are too stubborn to stamp out, or if there is a serious resurgence, then the lockdown will very much remain in place for millions of tired and frustrated residents. The economic fallout of the Shanghai and other lockdowns is something which we have also continued following since the、uh, Shanghai lockdown, in particular, was implemented in early April. Despite statements from local authorities that most factory production is up and running now in the Yangtze River Delta, in a recent Shanghai Securities News survey of 667 companies, about half had still only resumed less than 30 percent of production as of the 7th of May. And indeed, the real situation could be even worse. The newspaper said that the biggest challenges they face are quote disrupted supply chains and restrictions on staff movement. End quote. This is very similar to、uh, what U.S., EU, and Japanese businesses have identified as major challenges in recent weeks too. Indeed, speaking of Japanese factories, another survey published this week by the Shanghai Japanese Commercial and Industry Club found that almost two thirds of Japanese-run factories. In the financial and manufacturing center, that is Shanghai, have not resumed any production, and none of the companies surveyed had returned to planned levels of output. We found out yesterday too that China's road freight volume index was down 18 percent year on year in the week. Ending on May 8th, this is at the national level. In the period, 28 of the Chinese mainland's 31 provincial level regions recorded a decline in road freight volume. Regions with major COVID outbreaks、uh, and lockdowns were particularly affected. For example, road freight was down. 80% in Shanghai, 54% in Jilin in the northeast, and nearly 35% in Beijing. Yesterday, we discussed World Health Organization Chief Tedros expressing that China's zero cases policy is not sustainable, and that quote, "I think a shift will be very important. Now we know a lot about the virus, and we have better tools." End quote. Since then, the statement has been heavily censored from the Chinese internet. Even an article which included a video clip of Mr. Tedros、uh, Tedros's remarks posted on the United Nations WeChat account was quickly removed, and the article was tagged as "quote violating laws and regulations." End quote. But censors went one step further. On Weibo, a type of Twitter in China, searches for Tedros no longer worked as of yesterday, Wednesday evening, local time. Indeed, the only mention of the World Health Organization head was in state media. State-run Global Times, for example, wrote today that quote the comment from the WHO head. However, failed to grasp a full and accurate evaluation of China's fight against COVID-19, and such remarks coming from a person in his position is irresponsible. End quote. Unsurprisingly, the state media article couldn't leave it there. It continued quoting a professor with the China Foreign Affairs University. Quote: 
He also suspected whether Tedros's judgment had been swayed by overwhelmingly distorted reports in the Western media of the predicament Shanghai is facing when battling COVID-19. It is also possible that some Western media, such as Reuters, deliberately shuffled the question to Tedros to undermine the global contribution of China's COVID-19 fight ahead of a US-organized global COVID summit, said the expert. End quote. Okay, let's continue. If you guys enjoy the video, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help me keep this channel sustainable, Patreon, buy me a coffee, and crypto uh, links are in the description below. Buy me a coffee is perfect if you just want to give a one-off tip. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Uh, we have seen some moves on the diplomatic front with leader-to-leader uh, -leader talks in recent days between China, Germany, and France. On Monday, General Secretary Xi Jinping had a phone conversation with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. The readout from the Chinese side was fairly boilerplate. The following day, Tuesday, it was France's turn with Xi speaking to French President Emmanuel Macron. With both conversations, Beijing continued to push the idea that China and the European Union should work together on climate and the environment. China is a large attractive market. Let's separate business and politics. Don't get too close to the Americans, etc., etc. These themes in Chinese diplomatic overtures to the Europeans we know very well. We also know that they haven't been too effective in recent years and that the EU has become much more adversarial in their views towards the People's Republic of China, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Indeed, Beijing's diplomatic attempts to drive a wedge between Europe and the United States in the context of the Ukraine crisis has been clumsy, to put it charitably. To give one example of the rhetoric employed by Beijing over the weekend, Beijing's top official for Europe tweeted, quote, with Ukraine conflict happening on European soil, Europe is hurt the first and the most. The US, however, is raking in billions with rocketing arms trade and oil and gas sales and seeing financial capital flooding back to America. End quote. In a very telling move in late April, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, in his first Asian trip, visited Japan, not China, a signal that security trumps trade for his, uh, for his administration. In his speech, the Chancellor expressed that Germany seeks closer ties with countries that, quote, share democratic values in the Asia-Pacific region, end quote. And if that was not obvious enough, he continued by expressing, quote, it is no consequence that my first trip as Chancellor to this region has led today here to Tokyo. My trip is a clear political signal that Germany and the EU will continue and intensify their engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. End quote. And then today, Thursday, leaders from the European Union and Japan are meeting at a special summit in Tokyo to, quote, establish a blueprint for wide-ranging cooperation from trade to technology and supply chains, end quote. The blueprint uh, is set to establish joint standards for key future technology, from semiconductors and AI to 6G. One EU official of undisclosed rank attending the summit, speaking to Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post, expressed to the newspaper, quote, With the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the close relationship between Moscow and Beijing, there is even greater commitment by the EU to increase its role in the Indo-Pacific, and Japan is, of course, a key partner for that. End quote. Okay, last up, the Chinese housing market. Chinese financial media is reporting in recent days that bond investors are fleeing, in the words of one analyst, one of China's biggest, most important property developers, a player which we have been following since the beginning of the crisis last year, Shimao Group Holdings Limited, after it sought a one-year payment extension on a 475 million yuan, 70.6 million US dollar, onshore bond due later this month. This news coming hot off the heels of Evergrande achieving extensions for two bonds due this month too. The Shimao bond was issued in 2019 and the principal is due on May 22nd. After news of the extension plans, the bond's price plunged 21.1% on Tuesday morning and was suspended from trading by the Shanghai Stock Exchange. 
Chinese financial outlet Taixin writes that some analysts said the price drop reflects investors' disappointment about the extension proposal. Shimao has not provided any provisions to repay the principal in stages like other distressed developers have done. One asset management executive expressed, quote, The proposal shows that Shimao's liquidity has deteriorated. Investors will not be happy with the terms. End quote. The real estate developer, one of China's biggest, like many in the industry, has had a very tough year so far. According to a company statement released last Friday, in the first four months of this year, the company's contracted property sales plunged 63% year-on-year to about 2.8 billion yuan. Only about three of 34 assets it has listed this year have been sold, meaning that the mega firm is lacking billions of dollars of much-needed liquidity. Last month, global ratings agency Fitch wrote in a note, quote, Shimal's capital market access remains limited, and the repayment of its debt depends on its ability to extend maturities and dispose of assets, leaving a low margin of safety. End quote. With the recent Evergrande bond payment extensions, this means that Shimao Group, which in the early months of the housing crisis was seen as one of the more healthy developers, is now currently one of the most systemically risky firms in an industry which was already crisis hit before the Shanghai lockdowns. And these lockdowns have only greatly exacerbated the issue and the crisis in the critically important industry. Shimao has around 22 billion yuan of capital market debt maturing or possible within the year, as well as over a billion in offshore bank loans maturing this year too.